Welcome back, honors. All right, welcome back to it. Welcome back to this flip that we're going to post at about 6.35 in the morning, right? So like, yeah, it's early, but it's okay because we had like a really great class yesterday. Really got some solid stuff done. Like, for example, we executed Molly Jernigan in a really, really grandiose, really over-the-top way and stuff like that. You know, the thing's only true of Western civilization classes that someone's going to be make-believe executed in a really intense way. Now, the big thing about it, though, going into it, we left off talking about Charles the First, right? So we've been talking about the Stuarts up to this point, and I know some of y'all might be a little bit confused about what's going on. So give me two seconds to kind of review all this stuff, right? So we talked about this guy, Charles I, who is the son of James I, right? James I, the same king that did things that people liked, like having the English Bible translated, it by, uh, excuse me, let me start over, by having the Bible translated into English, the King James Version of the Bible, by having also the colony of Jamestown settled, by having the Plymouth Colony settled, leading basically in the first steps to the foundation of the United States of America, James did some things, right? But the biggest thing that about James, though, was James hated Parliament, James thought he was a divine right ruler, James wanted to be an absolutist, James James doesn't want to share power, right? You saw this in things like the gunpowder plot. You saw this in things like when he tried to make tobacco illegal. You saw this in a lot of different reasons. But basically it led to a really intense relationship between James I, the first Stuart King, to follow Elizabeth, who was a loved and respected Tudor monarch, right? So with that said, James would then die in 1625, and then rule would pass to his son Charles. The homely, skinny, short, like rocks in his mouth, running all over the place, son of James the First, right? Charles was just as bad, if not a little bit worse, right? He's just as bad, if not a little bit worse, because he believes in all the same things that his father believes in. He believes that he is a divine right ruler. He believes that he is a monarch that should be allowed to do whatever he wants. He believes he should be allowed to have more money, right? So he wants to redesign the banquet palace of Whitehall, which he does, right? He wants to do all this other different stuff. Looking at that banquet palace of Whitehall, for example, this right here is a very famous painting that was placed in the middle of that banquet house. This right here is come by Peter Paul Rubens, and it literally has a chubby little baby Charles flanked on either side by the female personifications of England and Scotland, and they're lowering a crown onto his head. And then you have literally either God or James bestowing the power upon him, right? So obviously, Charles believes in this divine right rulership, and he wants to go to war. He wants to go to war with France. He wants to go to war with Spain. And every time Parliament would tell him no, that they didn't want him to go to war, that they didn't want him to do these things, he would dissolve them, right? So the key thing you need to understand is that, yes, this is a power that kings have. You're allowed to dissolve Parliament, right? But it's not something you're supposed to just throw around willy-nilly. You're not supposed to just do it whenever you feel like. You're only supposed to do it during times of emergency. He's doing it because no one's listening to him, right? And he did this multiple different times. A couple times was under the advice of the Duke of Buckingham, right? A couple of, well, then the Duke of Buckingham is dead. And then a couple of times it was under the advice of his wife, Henrietta Marie, who is the French Catholic that's making a lot of people really, really upset, right? So, like, now the big thing about it, though, also remember, the Parliament is becoming full of Puritans. So they hate Charles' wife. And then Charles is telling Charles, or then... Charles's wife, Henrietta, is telling him to dissolve them. So things are just kind of really messy right now. The parliament hates their king, and the king hates his parliament, right? So he then enters into a period of time called the 11 Years of Tyranny, right? And during the 11 Years of Tyranny, a couple of different things happen, right? One, the relationship and bond between Henrietta Marie and Charles grows better than apparently it ever had. Charles claims that it was the best time of his life. He says that, oh, during my personal rule, I was the one in charge of this kingdom, and I was the one that decided these things. And he actually did collect his own taxes and collect his own tax money, like he really, really did. But the thing about it was the way he was collecting tax money, he was collecting like coronation fees and the stuff called ship money and like all this other stuff, basically forcing towns of England to pay him extra indemnities and extra fines so he could then spend it 
on himself. So the people of England are furious about this, right? But it's also the time that of like, it's a really weird relationship. It's a duality, right? When you look at Charles, he thinks it's awesome. He had his two sons during this time period, right? Charles I and James I. He had one of his daughters, Mary, who is going to become very important a little bit later on. So Charles, it's Charles II and James II. He has his two sons, has a daughter, and the people, though, are growing to loathe him because they don't want to pay for this guy's banquet hall to be redone. They don't want to pay for him to be able to go on foreign expeditions. They don't want to pay for these things. They're like, we are the people of England. We deserve our parliament. You will do this because we said so. Magna Carta! Yeah! Okay, so there you go. <laughs> there is like the rant for the day on that whole thing, okay? You got this strange relationship between these two. Now the people during the, this time do loathe him so much that they're actually weirdly excited when a war breaks out, right? A rebellion breaks out in Scotland, and he just realizes that he needs cash to suppress this rebellion, right? The reason why the war in Scotland broke out was all over a book, right? It was all over a book called the Book of Common Prayer, right? Now, if you talk to my AP kids, they know what this thing is very well. The Book of Common Prayer is basically a playbook on how the English church is supposed to operate mass after they're not Catholic anymore, right? They're like, okay, we're not Catholic anymore. We're Anglican now. How are we going to do this and how are we going to do it well, right? So the big thing about it, though, is that that Book of Common Prayer was then issued and forced upon the Scottish Presbyterians. The Scottish Presbyterians are like, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're Presbyterian. Granted, we are both Protestant, eh, down with the Catholics, but they don't want to necessarily share the same Book of Common Prayer. So a rebellion breaks out, and these monasteries get burned. And there were these other monasteries that Charles wanted to fix, and they get burned as well. And everybody starts freaking out, so he's forced to call Parliament back in a period of time called Long Parliament, where Parliament actually lasts for quite some time. And then in this moment, the Parliament decides to check him a little bit, to take his authority, insult him, and be like, you want to play that game? Fine, we'll play that game. The Parliament arrests and puts on trial his best friend, right? His best friend is a guy named Thomas Wentworth. Thomas Wentworth was his advisor and chief official during his 11 years of tyranny reign. He was the one that advocated for Charles all the time. He's the one that also believed that Charles was the divine right ruler. So the Parliament hates Thomas Wentworth's guts. Now the problem with this, though, is you can't really arrest the king because he kind of exists outside of the law in that sense. So they decide to arrest Thomas Wentworth. They put him on trial. Charles can do nothing to stop this because in the Magna Carta, yeah! eh, uh, in that document, you uh, cannot like a king cannot infringe upon habeas corpus, which is the right to a fair trial, right? So with that, Thomas Wentworth though is ex is like is brought before the trial, and he is then decreed to be executed, right? The Parliament is like, oh, well, we're gonna have you executed because. You're betraying the people of England, and you're also, like, encouraging revolts, and you're also doing all this other stuff, right? So the big thing is, like, so the big thing is they decide to execute him. Now, all execution letters, especially of upper staff of the king, have to have Charles's signature. So Charles has to sign the death warrant of his own friend. Oh, my God. And Thomas, or and Charles is literally trying to figure out any way to not do this, but he realizes that he has to. And so tears streaming down his face, sobbingly, he signs the death warrant of his own best friend. Now, ironically enough, this is all while his wife was not even in town. Henrietta was actually in France visiting family, and when all this stuff then blows up in his face, Henrietta comes back home and she's like, wait a minute, what did you just say happened? You're dealing with a rebellion, you're freaking out about the Scotland stuff, and you had Thomas Wentworth executed? What, what happened? And then they go, she goes, or he goes, oh, well, Parliament made me. Parliament made me have him executed. And Henrietta Maria was like, oh, well, first of all, you are the king. You have the right and the power to do whatever you want, right? And again, remember, she's French, so of course she believes this. Now, like, so, and on top of everything else, she says, oh, and by the way, I heard a rumor that the Parliament is the one who started the rebellion in the first place, right? So, dun, dun, dun. Like, so, like, the big thing about it, though, is that she had heard a rumor going around that the Parliament had started the rebellion in Scotland. Troop forced Charles to bring it back. So Charles, in a fury and in a fit of rage, marches down to the Parliament and freaks 
out, right? He flips out. He goes down there with the intent of arresting the five leading members of parliament, in parliament, including this guy named John Pym, right? He wants to go down there. He wants to have all of them arrested. He wants to have those five guys put on trial for their crimes against the kingdom, and he wants them to be executed. He marches down to parliament while, with his wife egging him on the entire way, gets all the way down there, bangs on the door with his cane, is the thing called the Black Rod of Charles, bangs on the door of parliament with his cane, says, open the door in the name of the king. And all the people behind the door went, no, tee and they like laughed at him. The parliament said no and laughed, right? Like so in the king's face. And so he breaks the door down eventually and they're like, where are the five leading members of parliament? And they're like, oh, they went out that back door. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. Hilariously speaking, while he was going down there, Five little old men in black robes just giggled and ran out a back door. They were like, tee hee, and just ran off, right? And so Charles, who is now ridiculously embarrassed, runs away to Scotland and begins to raise an army, okay? The parliament start raising one too. Now we've got two armies about to fight each other, then breaks out the English Civil War war, right? The English Civil War is going to be in three different phases, and it's going to last from about 1642 to 1651. Now, every single civil war, as you know, is a war with inside a country between two different armies, right? One army versus the other <clears throat> in a fit of rage trying to actually, like, basically destroy one another from inside a country, all right? Now, looking at this entire understanding, though, you need to understand as well that every single side has nicknames and names for each other, right? For example, in the United States Civil War, it was the Union and the Confederacy, a.k.a. the Yankees and the Rebels, right? So, like, the big thing about it, though, is every single side has a name and has a nickname given to them usually by the other side, right? So, like, just like in the American Civil War, Yankees didn't call themselves Yankees, Southerners called them that. And then Rebels weren't called Rebels by each other, they were called that by by the northerners right same kind of thing happens here you've got one the cavaliers right who are the charles supporters of the old model army and then you've got the roundheads or the parliament supporters right now i use these quotation marks the wrong way the quotes are supposed to be around the top ones these are the nicknames given to the other side by each other so cavaliers called or like this side charles supporters called these people roundheads and these people called charles supporters cavaliers why? Because Cavaliers is supposed to be an insult, basically saying that they're foreigners and that they're rich, like actually using from the word, Spanish word, Cavaliersos. But then, of course, the big thing about it as well is Charles supporters called the Roundheads. Roundheads, we don't really know why, but we think it's for one of two reasons. One, the helmet that they wore that actually made their head kind of round. Or two, the fact that they're like drummer boys and fife boys were poor, so they actually had to shave their head all the time to avoid lice, right? So now also another big thing that you need to jot down as well is that the roundheads were very heavily Puritan, okay? Like, so you got a lot of Puritans on the roundhead side, right? With the roundheads being heavily Puritan, it means that this is yet another element of like James's reign and Charles's reign that they had to constantly deal with. The Puritans had been being elected to parliament for quite some time, and they're being led by this really intense Puritan that we're about to talk about in two seconds. But we also need to write down one more other thing. Go over to Cavaliers. There are a couple of ways that you can spot a Cavalier just by the way he looks. Just like you can know a roundhead by their helmet or their hair, you can know a cavalier by three different things as well. One, their hair. Their hair was very long, very luxurious because it was long enough and they were wealthy enough to take care of it. They also usually had an ostrich feather in their hat because ostrich were exotic birds at the time that actually were very, very important to uh, the like international trade during the time period and ostrich feathers began to be a symbol of wealth, right? Because as you can see, Charles supporters are very wealthy. And then the last one, Cavaliers always had a very well-groomed mustache, right? So like those are the big three things that you always knew a Cavalier whenever you saw one, right? Now the roundhead leader though is gonna be the guy that takes them to victory victory is a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell. And this guy just screams Puritan out the gate with his black armor and his white collar, right? Now, Oliver Cromwell rises through the ranks and is a very astute and very intense military leader, right? He destroys the, or the Cavaliers in battle multiple times and raises himself into power, right? Now, the Roundheads are going to be victorious underneath Cromwell at several different battles, most importantly, one of the biggest ones being the Battle of Edge Hill, right? And the Battle of Naseby. Now, the big ones, though, going into it, the Roundheads are victorious also because they're much more brutal than the Cavaliers are, right? They were losing in the early, like, forms. The Roundheads were losing early on, but they end up coming back and winning the entire English Civil War. Now, we could spend days talking about 
what they did, who did what, and all this other stuff, but we're not going to do that right now, right? So the Roundheads are going to be victorious. What's going to end up happening, though, is Charles still refused to give in to the Parliament even after the fact. They were like, okay, so under the new government and after you have lost, you must sign this document stating that you will relinquish certain powers to the Parliament and blah, 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 blah. Charles refused. And one day while he was sitting there playing chess with one of his other friends, he receives a letter from the Parliament saying that he was going to be put on trial for his crimes against England since he refused to actually give in. So they put him on trial. They then executed the King of England. This is the second time that a monarch has ever been executed. And the last one was his grandmother, right? So like Mary, Queen of Scots, who was his grandma. Now they tried him, execute him, and he is the only, oh wait, no, not, that's not true actually. He's not the only leader to ever be executed by his people. He's one of the only ones leading up to this point, right? So they tried him, they executed him, and Charles is going to end up dead on a very, very cold, chilly morning in January, right? And I believe it was January 30th. Now, looking at this entire understanding as well, is you need to understand that he wore two shirts so he wouldn't shiver. He put an uh, orange stuffed with clothes in his pocket so he wouldn't pass out, right? But now, Charles is dead. So who is supposed to take over the crown? Well, the thing about it is... And this also right here, that's them holding Charles's head to the crowd. Look at that. Look how gross that is. Look at this kid, too, who's like, I want it. Now, anyway, so look, really, really quick. Pass it to me. I'm open. Who takes over now? Well, what? England's going to have no king for like 20 to 30 years. All right, so now we end up going into this thing, a period of time known as the Commonwealth period. And who their first leader is going to be is Oliver Cromwell himself, okay? That's right. England's got no king. It's now a republic, right? It's going to be ran by Puritans. Oh, crap. That means that you're getting into a situation where everything's going to be illegal. This guy is going to outlaw alcohol. He's going to outlaw dancing. He's going to outlaw bars. He's going to outlaw theaters. Now, how is it possible that a Puritan can pass all of these things and get them done? Well, in yellow right here is the one thing you need. It's because he creates this thing known as his rump parliament. The rump parliament was when he came into power in parliament with no king around. Oliver Cromwell decides to start firing anybody and everybody that won't agree with him, right? So he fires you, fires you, fires you, fires you because you won't agree with what he has to get done, right? And so he creates what's left over is a parliament that is completely loyal to him that will pass any law that he tells them to, right? And that was called his rump parliament, was the parliament that would do anything he told them to, right? And in that process, under the rump parliament, he does all kinds of stuff. He invades Ireland and killed a bunch of Catholics and priests and civilians. He let, This led to another war against Charles II, Charles Jr. Charles' son, the son of the now dead Charles, is going to come back to Scotland and fight a war against this guy, right? Trying to take the crown back, okay? Because he wants the Scots, to, he wants to become the Scottish and he wants to be the Scottish king and he wants to come back and be the king of England as well, right? All this other crazy stuff happens as well. And we'll get to all that stuff with Charles. But literally he ends up like, like converting to Catholicism. We'll get there in a little bit. He tried to cancel Christmas. He banned Halloween. He pushed the Navigation Acts on the colonies, which is going to help lead to the American Revolution. He closed bars. He closed theaters. He closed or like he fined people that didn't go to mass. He banned sports. You weren't even allowed to play sports in the Commonwealth period. So to say the least, nobody likes Commonwealth. But we're going to pick up right there on that stuff when we get back in class tomorrow. Y'all have a good one.